child life, but uh, typically you see child life specialists in uh, children's hospitals, and uh, background is using play to help children understand what's happening. So in the hospital setting, it's as, as uh, little as a child comes for immunizations, and um, a child life specialist job would be to help them be positioned in a way that five people aren't sitting on their head and wrapping them up in a sheet, letting them sit up and be in control of a situation. Two, um, child life also helps in kids understanding new diagnoses and um, how to cope with all of that. So I find it very similar to actually what David's sharing with what I'm going to share with you today about kids. Uh, my personal background is um, I worked at Phoenix Children's Hospital for about 18 years and now I'm currently over at Ryan House and we do children's hospice and uh, respite care. So let me, as I introduce myself to the kids, I'm the toy lady. They don't really know what child life is, they don't really care. They are just worried about me coming and talking to them and you know they're envisioning that I'm going to make them spill their guts. So usually what I do is I've, I've over the years have collected all of these and I'm going to have to pass them around because you need to touch them. <laughs> um, but what it is is I try to use this as a way to let the kids be distracted for a minute and do something that's comfortable and safe for them which is play so that it allows them the, the freedom to mentally kind of detach and talk about and process what's happening. So here in the front you get to touch it first. <laughs> there are Lincoln logs in there, you can't build a house. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the awesome uh, opportunity that ALS is offering to families. Um, with the program that they started about a year ago, it allows uh, me to come and do home visits with you or talk with you over the phone about how to help your kids or your grandkids. Um, a lot of times, you know, I don't profess to be any kind of expert. All I'm going to do is share with you what I've learned over the years from other families and what's worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. And um, a lot of what we can talk about, we can do over the phone because you guys know your kids the best. And so you can say, you know what, they're saying this or they're doing that. And I'm going to kind of give a brief overview of how to do, you know, explaining things. But each of your situations are going to be different. So just keep that in the back of your mind, but we can always chit chat on the phone and, and come up with ideas on how to make it different. Okay, I'm not technically advanced at all. Oh, there. So um, I don't know if these are phrases you've heard from kids before in your family about this. Uh, we used to run around and wrestle all the time. How come you tell me you're tired when I see you resting? You know, kids are very much in concrete uh, understanding of how things are, meaning they only understand what they can see, hear, feel, taste, touch. So if they see somebody resting or sitting in a couch or laying around most of the day, they're assuming that they're going to have energy later because that's what they do. They know if they lay down or they take a nap, they have energy afterwards. So concretely, they don't understand why maybe the uh, parent with ALS doesn't feel like they can play as much or be as active as they were because in the child's mind, they've already done it. They've already rested. Kind of with older kids, you might hear, you know, why can't mom just do all the dishes? Why do I have to do everything? Something to keep in mind is that not everything or not all the troubles you'll have or issues you'll face with your kids are related to ALS. Whether or not you do or don't have it, you're going to hear that same statement. You know, teenagers, I'm sorry, I have two at home, I'm allowed to say this, but they, I thought it was hard when they were toddlers. It's way harder now. Because the stuff that they did when they were toddlers, at least I could redirect them or get them doing something else. Now I got somebody telling me, you know, that they know better. So I guess I want to throw that out too because it's hard to remember that they might just be a pill because they're being a pill. And it has nothing related to grief or loss or coping or any of that stuff. Okay, so where do we start? Um, I hope that it's okay for me to kind of walk you guys through how do you talk to your kids and how do you explain stuff to them. Please stop me at any time if I'm off track or if it would be helpful to clarify it better. But my general rule of thumb, no matter what I'm talking to kids about, it could be about they've come to the hospital because they have a cut on their leg all the way up to understanding a diagnosis like ALS. I always start with, tell me what you know. And what I mean by that is, what have they seen? What have they learned? What have they overheard from other people? And that will give you a really good place to start with them, no matter what the age. I would say three to 25 year olds, I do the same thing. 
So tell me a little bit about what you've seen going on with dad. What, what's different? Is there anything different? Have they had to go to the hospital more? Have they had to have help with things more? You know, why is all of that? Because when we have the burden of feeling like that we have to tell all the information, it's hard to know where to start. But if the kids tell us kind of what their framework of understanding that they have, it's much easier to just fill in the gaps or clarify things. Um, it takes the burden off us feeling like we have to say all the perfect stuff. And quite honestly, they may only want to know this much. And we're thinking we got to tell them all this. Okay? So I always start with, what do you know? The other thing I do is, um, is use body books, or like I brought them with, like if I had a preschooler, this is a giant floor puzzle. And it's got um, things about the eyes and mouth and feet and toes and bones. I want the kids to have a basic understanding of how the body works. So if it's a three, four, five year old, I'm going to say, you know what your heart's job is? Your heart's job is to move your blood through your body and your lungs job. When you go like this, those are your lungs. Those are helping you breathe. And your brain, what do you think your brain's job is? And the preschoolers crack me up. They're always like, to think. You know, my brain's job is I think, that's what my mom tells me, is that I should think more. <laughs> you know, and I said, actually, your brain's job is to do all of the, the stuff that's going on in your body. I said, right now, are you thinking about blinking? And then they'll be like, yes, I am. <laughs> okay, but if I don't say that to you, you're still going to blink, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, right, so your brain's job is to do all that work and to tell all those body parts what to do. So you always start off really basic. If it's an older kid, um, I would say school age, maybe 6 to 10 or 11 year olds. I use body books as much as possible. You don't need anything fancy. You can even go on the internet and, and uh, pick up something basic. You, actually, the less words, the better. You just want them to understand how systems work. What do nerves do? What do muscles do? What do, what do bones do? What are all their jobs? How do they all work? Because then it makes more sense when you explain how the body isn't doing its job in certain ways. If I just start talking about a complex thing like ALS, they're going to look at me like, I don't even know what bones are. You know, I don't even know what a motor neuron is. And now you're talking to me and telling me something's wrong with them. So we got to establish what, what the basics are first. So I always show pictures whenever possible. I only explain what can be seen and experienced. And what I mean by that is sometimes we get really overwhelmed with feeling like we have to tell everything. If nothing's really different right now, you don't need to share it. It's not to say that you aren't going to be truthful, we're always truthful, but you don't have to tell every gory detail. So if right now they're just, a loved one is just having a little bit more difficulty walking, then you talk about how they're having a little more difficulty walking and how the brain is having a hard time telling the muscles to do the job. Then as things get different or you add things or you add a wheelchair or you add oxygen or you add BiPAP or something like that, then you explain what those things do and how they're helping the body and how they're allowing the body to do different things. And you kind of build on it. Um, the three things that kids always worry about that at some point you got to make sure you cover if they haven't asked you already is cause, contagious, and care for me. So cause is kind of obvious. They just want to know what caused it. If I come over and hug on you or when you kiss me, am I going to get it? You know, because there's so much in our culture, obviously, about hand sanitizer and washing your hands and making sure that you don't give anybody else germs and all that kind of stuff. It's important to explain how this is different. It's not like the cold. Because a lot of times what people tend to say is, oh, well, mom is sick. Well, the next time they're at school and they throw up and they go home and the nurse says, well, you're sick. The first thing they're going to jump to is, wow, I'm not going to be able to walk around as much because mom doesn't walk around as much. I'm going to need oxygen. I'm going to need all these other things because they're going to link those things together. The next thing is um, uh, care for me. Even the older kids want to know, what does this mean in real time to my life? So, for instance, a college-age kid, the first thing they're going to think of, well, if something happens to dad, am I going to be able to continue to go to college? What's going to happen to our family finances? So while it's important for the little kids, the older kids have just as many worries and concerns because now they understand how the world works and how that could change things. So if you are able to uh, address each of those things, it'll help relieve their anxiety. So the very, obviously the most difficult thing to talk about and the thing I get asked the most is how do we talk about future? How do we talk about progression or what that's gonna do? And how much do we say when? 
there's no right or wrong way to answer this question. Um, it's okay to say things in small parts. It's okay for a kid to come up and ask you a question and be like, is mom gonna die? It's okay for you to go, hey, you know, that's a really good question. I need to think about that and I need to, you know, find out some more information and then I'm gonna get back to you. You might know the answer already. You don't need to answer it right then if you're not in a place where you're ready to do that. That's okay. They're gonna be okay. They probably didn't, you know, expect a really long answer. Or another way to do it is to say, why do you ask that? Because you might think that they're asking this whole, this explanation, and it might just be they're outside and saw a bird that had died outside, and they're thinking, oh, how did that happen? How did people die? Not even relating anything else. So sometimes you can ask them back and go, why do you ask? Um, with the older kids, I really encourage you to uh, share with them about balancing internet and family and peers and information. Um, like I tell moms, when you first found out you were pregnant, everyone felt the need to tell you their horrible birth story. That's the first thing they tell you. It's kind of like that with this. Anytime you share um, a new diagnosis or something that's going on in your family medically, everyone's going to feel the need to tell you every horrible thing they know about it. Really not helpful. So that's what kids at school, that's what kids, that's what adults at school, that's what their friends are going to say to the kids. They're going to go, oh, well, I knew somebody with that, and oh, it was really bad. Or, oh, my friend's brother to brother was fine. How come yours isn't fine? You're going to get all over the spectrum. So what I tell kids is, you know what, it's really important that if you have any questions about this, that you just come and ask me. Because I will answer whatever question you have. I may not have the answer right away, but I will answer any question you have. Um, Another way to answer it is, what the doctors are telling me now is that my body is doing this. So when it's a big global question, are you dying? The doctors tell me that my lungs are not doing their job as well as they used to do their job. My muscles aren't doing their job. It's making it harder for me to breathe. I have the oxygen because, you see what I mean? Because even if I had a physician walk in and say, I think it's gonna be next Wednesday, stranger things have happened been doing this long enough that I've seen people that they say next Wednesday and it's six years Wednesdays. And then I've seen it where it's Sunday. There's just no way for us to predict any of that stuff. So it's better to not give your kids a concrete answer because they'll hold you to it. So if, if you say, well, the doctor told us three to five years, you may have just said that off the cuff. <coughs> I guarantee they have a calendar somewhere that they're counting the days. And they're gonna come back to you and go, mm, year three, where are we at? So it's just really important to say, you know what, we just don't know. But when I do know something, I will tell you. If something changes, I will tell you. If you notice something changing and I haven't said anything yet, come ask me about it. Okay, so just real quick about different age groups and what's important to them. Um, with little ones, like birth to two years, they are really, um, they do best when they have the same caregivers and the same routine. So if you have a lot of chaos going on and you have a lot of different people coming in and out of the house to help you and support you, that's going to be hardest on your infants and, and toddlers because they need the same schedule to feel secure in their environment. They can't verbalize, I don't like that I've had four different people today, but they'll not sleep as well, they'll not eat as well, they'll be crabby all the time. That's their way of responding to it. Or toddlers become more clingy because they don't understand why people are gone more maybe been in the hospital a lot, and so they all of a sudden latch on to mom's leg and won't go to preschool anymore. That's their way of, again, verbal, that's their way of saying, oh, I'm not happy with this, these changes. Uh, one way that you can do like a comfort item is um, have your loved one wear like a, I call it a lovey, but lack of a better word, a piece of fabric that's soft that you can um, pin to the inside of uh, your loved one's jammies and have them wear it for a couple days so it smells like them. And then you can use that little levy for the infant or toddler to rub up against their face or to lay with or to snuggle with because it smelled like them. Preschoolers, um, I think the picture pretty much says it. <laughs> so they, um, they have some understanding about the world, but they integrate magical thinking too. So like an example is um, I had a little one that we had talked all about the 
uh, going down to the operating room and seeing all the equipment and what it was all for and all that kind of stuff. And I had failed to talk to him about the lights. It didn't occur to me. So when he went down there and he, they laid him down on the bed, he looked up and if you've ever been in an operating room or hospital room, they have the big circular lights that are connected like this. Well, he knew they were lights, but he thought that once he laid down, they would come alive like an octopus and tan him down. So you kind of have the real, but you kind of have the magical, and then they apply it all to themselves. So um, I had another preschooler that a parent um, kind of had a falling accident after um, the child had given him green Kool-Aid. So dad had asked, oh, you know, can you go get me some green Kool-Aid? The child went and got it, brought it to him. Shortly after he drank it, he collapsed and had to be taken to the hospital. Well, in that child's mind, green Kool-Aid causes collapsing. They don't see the connection. Or I had another kiddo that was taking a nap when father got ambulance to the hospital. No longer naps anymore because bad stuff happens when you nap. So that's how preschoolers' minds work. They just kind of understand a little bit about how the world works, but they add the magical from cartoons and movies and all the other stuff and mix it together. Um, and they do much better with routine and consistency. And I, I might be talking out of order, but just because it makes more sense. I don't know if you guys have seen these Hallmark recordable storybooks. They're not cheap, but I have to say they're really cool because um, you can have your loved one read the story and record it, and then that becomes a ritual that you do every night at bedtime. So maybe that, that your loved one is no longer able to tuck the child in bed every night, but they can have the story read to them that has their voice. And these batteries, even when the batteries go out, the recording never goes away, so you can always take it out and put, put it in something else. So um, I just think that's a, a different way to kind of incorporate your loved one being able to still have that connection with the child even though they physically aren't tucking them in bed or doing caregiving. Oh, that was my little lovey picture. <laughs> we call them lovies at our house. And Hallmark actually has a lot of cool stuff like that. Um, this is a, it's a little picture frame that has a recording button. So they, you could put a picture of your loved one in there and have a recording from them. So sometimes when the toddler preschooler is a little insecure, really wants to spend time with, with that loved one and just can't, that's an easy way to be like, oh, let's go get that picture out. Let's hear what he says. And he's going to be like, I love you. Oh, okay, let's go on and let's go play. So school age kids are like 6 to 11 year olds. And you might see changes in behavior at school. You might think that they're understanding everything and they're coping with everything great, but then all of a sudden you hear the teacher kind of say, you know, he's been kind of mean at school lately. Or you notice that the friends aren't coming over anymore, or uh, maybe the grades are slipping. They're usually like a straight-A student and now they're kind of B student. Um, it's not that it's a bad thing, but that might be an indication that they're not holding it together all the time. Um, they may or may not want their school or peers to know about what's going on at home. Um, some kids want to know, some kids don't, but that's an opportunity for you to give them control. So you can say, you know what, this is what's going on with our family. Do you want your friends to know? Do you want your teachers to know? Okay, if you do, do you want to tell them or do you want me to? Do you, are you comfortable with them talking about it in class? Or would you rather them just know in case you're having a bad day and you want to go talk to them and tell them you're having a bad day? Or do you want everybody to know? Uh, because kids feel very powerless when they walk into school and they had, maybe that's a kid that didn't plan on anybody knowing about it, and they walk in and the first thing is, teacher, oh, I'm so sorry to hear what's going on in your family. And the kid's like, oh, that's not my coping, I don't talk, I don't, we don't do that. And they're going to shut off and then they're not going to talk to you anymore because they're not going to trust you because they're going to think you're going to tell everybody. And that's too vulnerable for them. Um, You've got to help them balance being too helpful with not helping enough. Is it realistic to ask a school age kid to help with chores because you need help with chores? Yes. Do you have them do everything? No. I, I have to say my worst copers are type A personality kids. And what I mean by that is they are, when, when I talk to parents, they'll say, you know, he's doing the best. You know, he's got straight A's, he's doing all the chores at the house, he's helping me prepare meals. It's amazing, he's doing great. I just, every day I tell him how amazing he is and how glad I am he's doing everything. They actually have the hardest time because while that is their personality, that's how they cope is to do. 
So they do tasks, and that's kind of help, how that helps them get through things. But then they don't feel like they can ever say, I can't do it today. Because the expectation is they're that person in the family that takes care of stuff. You know, there's the res irresponsible kid, and then there's the responsible kid. And so, again, regardless of the age, it kind of starts about school age, but I see it all the way up into early 20s, where the responsible kid doesn't feel like they have the ability to say, look, I can't be responsible this week. I need somebody else to manage this. So it's important for you to kind of pull them aside and be like, hey, you know what? If you need to go to Colorado for a weekend with your friends, you need to do that. Well, but mom, no, you don't have enough caregivers. And you know what? We'll work it out. We'll work it out. You need to go and do what you need to do. Or, um, you know, some parents will say to me, he's never home. He's never here. He never helps with anything. This is driving me crazy. I need somebody to help me. This, they're 18. I need help. It's okay for you to expect the help, but just have a conversation with them to say, maybe this is hard for them to be around. Maybe they're gone all the time because it's too much to be home. And so if you have a conversation to say, I get it. I understand why you don't want to be here. This is hard. But here is the reality. I need you to do these five things for me every week. I, I, that's what I need you to do. I won't ask anything more of you, but these are the things come, you know, I water. I need you to do these for me. And I will do my best to allow you the freedom to be able to do what you need to do to go and do, take care of your stuff. Sure. Uh, and school age kids are really more concerned about the present. They don't really think about down the road. If I ask you, and, and teenagers too, if I say, what are your goals for your, your teenager? You're going to say, well, I want them to go to college and be happy and get married. And if I ask the teenager, they're going to be like, I just want to get a job in the summer and I want to pay for my car in three months. You're on totally different pages. So that applies to diagnosis stuff too. You're thinking long term, you know, if he's gone all the time, he's not spending time with his mom and he's going to regret this later in his life. He needs to be home, he needs to spend time with him or her because he's going to regret it later. You can't force that on a teenager. Developmentally, it's just hard for them to keep that in the same space. You try to balance it and you try to say, hey, you know, I'd love for you, to, we're going to have a you know, picnic this week and I'd really love for you to be around and we're all going to go to a family movie together, I'd really love for you to be here. Um, and then, you know, don't worry about it. we're not doing anything for another two weeks. So you kind of give them opportunities to come in and do stuff, but you're not saying, you need to spend time because then they'll regret you I mean they'll really not like you and it will make for more complicated grief later because then they'll know that you told them and they didn't do it so then they'll feel even worse about themselves that they chose not to um, sometimes you'll see with teenagers that um, some kids personalities that they suddenly want to be the adult or the medical decision maker in the family Mom, you, I don't think you listened good enough in the appointment. You know, I need to be going to these appointments with you. I don't think you took enough notes. Do you know what that drug does? Do you know what those side effects are? You know, again, not unusual. They're just trying to develop their personality and where their role is in the family with all of this. It's up to you. If you want them to be that person and that support and you want them to understand that stuff, bring them along. But don't let them be the final decision maker. Because along with that comes if there are anything negative side effects that come, then they'll take it personally. You can say, I want to hear your input. That's really great. That's awesome that you did that 10-page research paper on that drug, because now I have a better understanding of how to make a good choice right now, but you need to be okay with whatever choice I make. Um, this is happens whether you're dealing with chronic illness or not, but increased moodiness and that try, may try to rebel or test boundaries because Sometimes kids go through this weird phase when they have a chronically ill parent and they think, well, it doesn't matter anyways. I can go drive 90 miles an hour because what's going to happen? He can't do anything about it. He can't ground me. What's that? And so they have this weird perception that somehow the rules don't apply. Um, they might rely on peers more for support than parents. So if, they, if you see them having close relationships with certain people, it's okay for you to get to know their parents maybe and just say, hey, how can we work together and how can I help support your kids too with all this going on with what's happening with us. And then the other thing that's really important for any age, to be honest, but what's most important for the adolescents and school age kids is legacy work. Um, and this is a hard topic to talk about, um, but I just want to throw out there, um, it doesn't have to be something, like I've had families share with me over the years, they'll say, you know what, I, I'm, not, I'm not gone yet. I'm still here. I don't want people to act like I'm gone. 
because I'm not. And so having everybody sit around and videotape me and ask me stories and stuff is really depressing because it makes me aware of what's going on. And so my answer to that is there's no reason why one person has to do it. We should all be doing it. You know, I don't have anybody in my family with ALS, but I do it with my kids. So the way we do it is I have a notebook and, um, well, my kids are 16 and 13, but so what I do is I write a question in it and then I leave it in their bedroom and then they answer it and write me a question and they leave it in my bedroom. And we just go back and forth. And what it ends up being is stuff about our lives without us ever having to talk about it and it's on paper. And then later on, here it is. Now you can be, you know, I, I come up with some questions and stuff to get you going. But, you know, your kids don't really want to know what your favorite movie was or what your favorite book is. They want to know, can you, you know, twist your tongue upside down? Mm. Are you left-handed or right-handed? Are you good at singing? Do you sing in the shower? You know, do you, have you been to China? They, they want to know the, the quirky things about you that makes you you. That's what makes it fun. Because as David was talking about with grief work, later down the road when they have that trigger, it'll be something that they'll go, you know, I remember mom writing about that. Ah, oh, that just cracks me up. I remember when she was telling me about that that one day. And it helps turn it into, we had the conversation before, and now it's here, and you can link them better in a positive way. Instead of, man, I, didn't, I don't know that about my mom. That's the hardest thing is like Mother's Day, Father's Day come up, and our whole culture and society is built around it. So anytime you go somewhere, somebody will say, oh, well, what did your mom like? And if you feel like you don't know anything, it's really hard. really makes it, makes it much harder to do. Um, I found the other day, I was in uh, Barnes & Noble, I thought this was kind of cool, it's just basically a list book. So if you feel like you're not creative or you can't think of any questions, they make books. <laughs> you're not off the hook, you need to do this. Um, okay, so I'm almost done. This is just um, something that I really feel that is so true and appropriate. Plato wrote it so many years ago, about you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than a year of conversation. You know, it's not what you tell or how you talk to your kids or, or worrying that you're going to say something you shouldn't. Play with them. Spend time with them. You'll get to know them and they'll ask questions through their play that you don't have to feel like, okay, let's talk about what's going on in the family. They're going to do it if you're playing grocery store or you're, you know, playing a board game with them. They're going to start talking. <laughs> so the only thing I didn't include in this is um, if you've never had a loss or experienced something like that in your family before, it's important for kids to have an understanding of life cycle. And what I mean by that is everything lives and everything dies, and what does that look like? For little kids, you talk about it if you see a bird out on the sidewalk or if you have a fish that something happened to them. Um, and you can incorporate your faith base into it then. If you can talk about it before it's personal, it makes it easier to explain later. If you've never had a conversation about life and death and faith and all of that about anything, when it's personal, it's very hard to explain both concepts at the same time. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And think about how you kind of um, handled the loss previously. So I have a friend that had, <coughs> excuse me, a, um, a hamster. And she called me one day and she said, okay, so the hamster died while the kids were at school. So we just threw it away, and it's, it's been three days, nobody said anything, so I think we're good. <laughs> you know, then I've got the other extreme of, well, when our dog, you know, Buddy died, we had a parade, and we light a candle every Friday at four, and we have buttons we wear, and... <coughs> so if you've experienced loss before, even with pets or even with anything else, and that's how you guys all coped, it's going to be very similar. So if, if, if you threw the hamster away while the kids were at school, we got some work to do. <laughs> and if you're having parades, that's okay, but you might want to tone it down because they may not want to parade every day. <laughs> so um, it's kind of like what David's saying, how you cope before is how you're going to cope later. So if you feel like you're, you are the person that would throw the hamster away and you don't ever want to talk about this, thank you very much, that's when we can have a conversation and start with some basic stuff and get you going. Okay? Questions? I know I talked a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny, so much.